Hello Auggies Worldwide, I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with another episode of Ask Dave. Now, this question from Pat Davis, uh, KQ4BRW, who is in Florida, um, seems like a simple question, but it actually is the tip of an iceberg of something a lot deeper and has to do with emergency operations. Let me tell you what she has to say. Hi Dave, I really appreciate your videos on EMPs and CMEs and preparation for them. My husband and I are pretty new to ham radio and are members of two local emergency radio communications groups. We need to come up with a plan for, and that's good, a plan because when the time comes to perform, the time for planning is over. We need to come up with a plan for contacting other hams in our area if the grid goes down and the repeaters are down. We usually practice on nets on VHF repeaters and we can't reach most of the other members via Simplex VHF. We haven't been able to reach anyone even at night on HF frequency 3970 which is what we were planning on doing. I can almost bet you have a vertically polarized 80 meter antenna for that frequency. You need horizontal polarization for NVIS. We are about 30 to 40 miles from other hands. Flat land, yes, Florida is flat, I've been there. Flat land, but lots and lots of oak trees. We seem to be too far apart for VHF or UHF and too close together for HF. For VHF, we have an ICOM 5100A with a 9-foot Comet antenna on top of our 24-foot high two-story house. And the Yesu FT950, nice radio, uh, with 92-foot NFED antenna stretching across a pasture and into a 20-foot high tree. Thank you for any suggestions that I can pass along. I've watched hundreds of your videos. There's a lot going on under the covers here. When you want to do uh, emergency type communications, the first thing that you have to remember is that you are not the only people who are going to be trying to do emergency communications. Not only will other private individuals who think they have some secret arrangement available, uh, but also the more official ARES or RACES uh, or auxiliary communications or whatever that has some kind of memorandum of agreement with the local emergency authorities. And they have plans too. Those plans are generally public and you can get hold of them and see what they're going to do. Usually it's best for you to align yourself with one of these groups if for no other reason than to listen in to find out what's going on. Very often these groups operate on VHF, although almost always they have a uh, frequency on 80 or 40 meters uh, to be used for NBIS. Now let's tackle a couple things first. The classic military paradigm is to organize, train, equip, and deploy. And so you can't deploy until you've organized yourselves, trained, and equipped yourselves properly. Now you're doing many of the right things. Part of organizing is a plan. Usually uh, this plan recognizes that other entities are going to be trying to use those same frequencies. The quick thing to do is develop some backup frequencies, uh, but there's only so many simplex frequencies and people are going to be using those. Another thing that you could do, and I recommend this, is to hurricane-proof that uh, repeater. It is possible to buy hurricane towers. These are towers that won't blow over in a hurricane. They're rated for very high wind loading. And it seems almost paradoxically that these towers are often uh, freestanding, don't have guys. Uh, the other thing that you need to do for your repeater, make sure you have a hurricane-proof antenna. 
that won't bend in the wind. Take you a little bit of work to do that. You may have to make your own. Uh, but also, you want to make sure that that repeater has power backup. The usual way for doing this is batteries or batteries and solar panels. Solar panels can be an issue in a hurricane, I know. They have a large wind area and can get blown loose uh, if they're not extremely firmly uh, held together. The idea is to have enough solar panels so that the repeater can run independent of the local uh, civil electrical network or the electrical utility. Now understand that that repeater has an owner and that that repeater may already be coordinated with some other group for emergency use. So you think it's a repeater that's hardly ever used. Believe me, it can become extremely busy in the event of an emergency like a, a hurricane, which seems to be the usual emergency in Florida. Now, the other emergencies are uh, flooding and fire. All those oak trees will burn. And if you have a very dry year, you can have problems with wildfires in Florida because the vegetation is so lush that when it dries out, it can burn readily. So you want that repeater to be in an area where it doesn't get hit by any of those. So you might want to put a 150 meter circle around the repeater where you remove the vegetation and put gravel or something like that out there so the fire can't burn up to and around the repeater. The things that spread fire are sparks. So if everything on your repeater close to the ground is metal, there's nothing for all of those sparks to ignite. Okay, and the repeater tower, which will be limited in height by FCC regulations and so on, can be up above that and out of the fire zone. There are two kinds of fires. There are crown fires and ground fires. The crown fires go from treetop to treetop and leave what's on the ground pretty much alone. Ground fires often leave the tops of trees alone. This is the kind of fire that happened in Paradise, California several years ago when it completely wiped out the town. It was a ground fire. The crowns of the trees stayed pretty much intact, but the houses were burned. Now, there are a few houses that were not burned because they were made to be literally fireproof. And you want to do the same kind of thing with your repeater. I would put it in a concrete building with a steel roof. Okay, now those sparks will get into any nook and cranny they can inside that roof. So make sure that uh, the wood you use is treated for fire prevention and so on. Um, let's see, now that's the repeater. Uh, and then you can use the repeater during uh, periods of emergency. Now, often if you are doing emergency and you are coordinating with other agencies, you will have certain tasks to perform during emergencies once they activate their nets. Uh, one of these is to be on standby for deployment. There have been times in the past where different fire departments could not communicate. Those hiccups have largely been solved, but they do still happen. So what they'll do is put a ham radio operator with each fire crew. Uh, another thing that's very common is to put a ham radio operator at each shelter so that uh, health and welfare information can be shuttled back and forth. Another common place to put hams is at a hospital, uh, like in the ER or in the hospital's command center, uh, to provide communications in the event that their own communications go down. Believe me, um, Hospitals spend time saving lives, not worrying about communications equipment. So it might be a good idea to include that in your exercises to make sure that all of those things do work. So 
plan. Part of the plan is the frequencies that you will use. Florida has a band plan, covers mostly VHF and UHF, tells you what the repeater pairs are and what the simplex frequencies are. Just because it's listed as a simplex frequency doesn't mean that somebody else is going to use that same frequency. You'd be surprised in taking a look at it at how few simplex frequencies there are. And you don't want to go operating outside of the frequency set aside for FM because other people are relying on those frequencies. So in your plan, if you've got a little group that want to keep in touch with each other for helping somebody or whatever, first try to coordinate with the uh, county level emergency operations center. Okay, uh, they will have a emergency communications plan and you want to make sure that ham radio is written into it, which uh, it probably will be. The Department of Homeland Security suggests that. Now, let's talk about your uh, HF problems. A long wire antenna is directional. It is directional in the direction that the long wire is pointed Okay, long wire antennas are what are called wave antennas. And a uh, long wire antenna is, by definition, two to three wavelengths long. So on uh, 80 meters, that would be anywhere from 160 to 240 meters long, multiplied that by three. The end result of that is that what you have is probably not technically a long wire, but just a wire antenna that needs pretty heavy tuning in order to make it work. Um, you want to run an antenna that you're going to use for NVIS probably no further than 25 feet from the ground. I would recommend a dipole or an NFED dipole or something like that. One of the problems with NFED dipoles is that for them to work on the higher bands, they'll only work on the lower part of 80, which is not the part you want. However, companies like uh, uh, My Antennas make antennas that are called the 7510. They've got, they have a part of them that allows them to work on the upper part of the 75 meter band and then all the others. Those can be used for NVIS, okay, uh, very nicely. Um, if you are having trouble with NVIS, try reorienting your antenna. Um, at night, generally it's 80 meters, but with the new sunspot cycle, you might be finding better luck on 40 meters. So give it a try. Um, NVIS should allow you to work any station from next door to out about on the order of 500 miles. Okay, so the one at 500 miles is hitting the ionosphere at pretty close to a 45 degree angle, but we still call it near, near vertical incidence skywave trend. Uh, near vertical incidence skywave, yeah. Now, as far as frequencies to choose, you're going to want to have your repeater, if it's club owned, uh, put there. You're going to have to make sure that the use of your repeater is coordinated with everybody else in the area that's making plans. The big people making the plans are at the county level, okay? That's the way FEMA does things. Now, you want to become smart with some of the FEMA documentation, there's training documentation and training classes that you can take online. And the most important one of those is about how an incident command center works. And you need to learn that because you're going to be coordinating with that. So you need to look upon what you're doing as not just checking on each other, but also um, assisting the community with the communications that you want there. Now I mentioned about organize, that includes the plans, train, meaning to use those frequencies, and to 
coordinate with other training plans. Every year there's what's called a simulated emergency test. You want to be part of that. And uh, train. Uh, and that means taking the time to really learn your radios, learning about how to put a new channel into your radio if your computer is down. Now, I recommend usually programming uh, radios with computers because it's just wildly easier than trying to do it uh, from the front panel. But there is a way to do it from the front panel, and you may need to do that. So learn how to do that. You will exercise your, uh, yourself with weekly uh, nets or monthly nets or bi-monthly nets, whatever, so that you can make sure that your equipment is in operating position. Make sure that you have backup power yourself. Now that could just be a 12 volt battery that you keep charged. I recommend if you get it from Walmart, get the so-called marine deep cycle battery. That's a misnomer in terms all the way around, but it's a lot better battery than an automobile starting battery, which is not designed for slow discharge over a long period of time, but rather for high discharge over a short period of time. Whereas deep cycle batteries are designed for low discharge over a long period of time. Now I have a solar panel. It's a large one, 250 watts, and it's sitting out back in the sun almost all the time. And it charges a lithium uh, iron phosphate battery that's sitting under the desk that was sent to me by a Chinese manufacturer for long-term test. And I power my entire station off of that thing. And so I have perpetual power here. I have as much power as I can use. Now, this is a long way around the barn to answer your question, but you're going to need to make sure that everyone in your group has had a turn and several practices to operate as net control. And the, the people on your net know how to act as net control. I've told of a time at an exercise that uh, we did previously in Louisville, Colorado. We had one old guy there who thought he knew better than I did. Uh, I think he had a PhD and I've only got a master's. So, you know, he's smarter than I am, he thought. He did not see any reason for net discipline. He says people should just talk to each other. He learned very, very quickly, within the half an hour, that his approach doesn't work. A net, especially for emergencies, is a directed net. Periodically, the net control calls for check-ins. When your station is announced as having checked in, you stay quiet. If you have something for the net control, the net control will pull the stations. Say, anybody got? And then you can interject that you have something. And then the net control will come back to you and say, go, give me your information. And then you wait for the net control to decide what to do. This is called a directed net. And by using a technique like this, even though it seems overly militaristic, it works. And why it's called that is because it works for the military too. Very careful net control, sometimes called net discipline. Okay, And if you are working with uh, FEMA or your county EOC or something like that, you definitely are able to do this sort of thing. So there you go, uh, Pat. I hope that sheds a little bit light on what you're doing there. One thing that you can do on VHF, uh, remember that height matters. That's the second rule of antennas. Get your antenna up higher. Uh, get a little uh, like a TV tower or something like that that you can put your VHF antenna on and get it way up in the air. Now that means you're going to have to use something like RG213. I do not recommend RG8U but RG8X is too lossy for use at VHF. Go with RG213, or if you really want to go deluxe, LMR400. 
not 240, but 400. The problem with LMR 400 is it takes special tools and special connectors to make work. Uh, and the connector is about $25 a piece, and you can spend a couple hundred bucks for a proper tool set on that. Uh, your group should buy one of those, and everybody can use it. Okay, so now for your uh, HF antenna, um, I would go, if you could, I go with an NFED half wave for 75, uh, uh, so the, my antenna's model number is EFHW, -E NFED half wave, 7510. The 75 is important because that gives you the upper portion of the 80 meter band. And then that way, you can uh, do NVIS on that. It's a resonant antenna. So you probably won't have to use the tuner. Just the tuner that's built into your radio should be able to do that just fine. Now the NFED half wave can be set up in a variety of configurations. From the tip of your house or your rooftop out to a tree or something like that. Make sure you take into account that trees move. Um, or to pole out there that you've got guide, or you can do an inverted V with like a 20 to 30 foot pole in the center, and that should work uh, just fine for you. Okay, so you said thank you for any suggestions, uh, and there you go. He, she also says that she's watched hundreds of my videos. Uh, this would be a video in the early 1000s, that comes up to you, and uh, I hope you enjoy them and hope you, that you have found them useful. I keep giving this same advice to people who are doing emergency communication, to remember that you are not doing it in a vacuum. There are a whole bunch of other people also in the same emergency who are trying to deal with this emergency, and you're all going to step on each other if you're not coordinated. So there you have it. If you like this channel, please subscribe. Uh, also, click the bell so you'll be notified of uh, future videos that come up using whatever you set up for notification. I get a little block on my screen down in the corner that there's something new. Um, you can also, if you want, right after I say 73, there's going to be a page with different ways that you can contribute to this channel. One I'll just mention here is if you go to decastlercom slash tip hyphen jar, it takes you to PayPal and you can do a one-time contribution, whatever amount that you want, as long as it's in integer multiples of a dollar. Now, I would recommend not doing a dollar because then PayPal takes most of it. Uh, but doing two, three, four dollars for a one-time type thing uh, will buy me half a Big Mac. So there you go. And until we next meet, 73.